Hi everyone, and thanks. Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. My name is Julie Endel. I'm the one stop operator for South Central Wisconsin. Um, thanks for joining us today for our reentry resources and programs for your community. We have a lot of different really great resources and wonderful colleagues that are joining me today to introduce you to a number of different programs um, that are there for folks that might be re-entering your community. I know sometimes in our helping professions, we want to have all the answers right away. Um, none of us can do it alone, and so that's why I brought all of my friends here with me today to try and introduce you to some new topics. In addition to that, there are some resources that are for you that uh, Mark has put together. And then we do have um, an A to Z listing of community resources that you can use as well. So um, look for those two resources in your, um, in the, when, when the PowerPoint goes out and the recording goes out. Um, again, I've got a lot of different speakers that are here today, but we thought what we would do is start with someone from Corrections. Um, so we do have uh, Chris who's here along with Carly. And what they're going to do is talk a little bit about Reentry 101, that's Chris. And then Carly's gonna pop in and she's gonna talk about the Community Corrections Employment Program or sometimes known as CISO. Um, Chris, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Right. Thank you, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm a Corrections Field Supervisor in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I've been with the department for 24 years, uh, majority of that time in, as an agent and always in the community. Um, so just some background, we have about 68,000 people on community supervision in Wisconsin. Um, and we have field offices in every one of our uh, counties and multiple counties have multiple offices. Um, in each of our eight regions, we have a community uh, employment program coordinator. Uh, Carly is uh, mine and my employee and uh, she covers region one, which is a large section of South Central and uh, Southwestern Wisconsin. Uh, so a part of reentry always comes into uh, either a what's a jail, what's a prison, how do people get to where we are supervising them. Um, a jail is a sentence imposed by the court to a sheriff uh, run facility, a county jail. Um, if they are also placed on supervision at that time with a probation parole agent, um, then that agent would be expected to be seeing that person while they are incarcerated. Um, and working on a relapse plan or a reentry plan. If a person is sentenced to prison, usually a sentence of a year or more, they're sentenced to a Department of Corrections DAI, Division of Administ uh, Adult Institutions, and they are sent to one of our uh, prisons. And there the agent uh, works side by side with the social worker and the agent starts doing uh, work with the client getting ready to come out about six months prior to release. So in a jail setting, they're gonna be working with that client all throughout. Uh, monthly contact would be the standard. Uh, when somebody goes to prison, the agent is expected six months out to be working with the social worker on a plan uh, for release. And then that's followed up at 90 days from release and then one month from release. Um, difference between probation and parole. Probation is a status in the state of Wisconsin. So the person has been placed on probation. It's a distinctive status change, whereas a parole or extended supervision for anybody sentenced after 2000 has been sentenced by a court to a sentence. Uh, and that can be a bifurcated sentence, which means a period of incarceration and a period of extended supervision post 2000. Prior to that, it would be just a uh, indeterminate sentence that would be a 20 year prison sentence, some of that was served inside, some of it's gonna be served outside. The agents who do the work, do the work with the same clients. We do not have a system uh, in Wisconsin where probation is seen by one person and parolees are seen by somebody else. They're all the same. Um, standard conditions, we have about 18 um, that are standard rules of supervision that govern all the things they can and cannot do. And there's a good list of those. Um, but by and large, uh, we're looking at what drives that person's criminogenic, uh, we're looking at criminogenic needs. We're looking at what it drives them. And we are working on a case plan that really involves the client to figure out a pathway that keeps them from going back into either a jail setting or any kind of sanction for that matter. Um, and that's where one of those stability factors is employment. And so it's something that we do focus on. And it's something that agents would be expected to be working with somebody like Carly and CSEP and all the other panelists here, frankly, um, 
to be working as a whole community in order to support that individual on their reentry efforts. Um, so I am available for any kind of specific questions that might come up, um, but generally just know that on the, we never want, we never try to plan for somebody to release from prison or jail to be homeless. We have emergency housing, we have temporary housing, we have structured residential housing. Um, we try as best we can to make sure that the, the person coming out of custody lands in the best possible position to succeed. Um, and we have a lot of resources at hand, but there are times those don't always work. And that's where we oftentimes are asking for help from our community partners to help pick up where we don't have the ability, availability. Um, but to talk about some of those programs that we do use upon release will be Carly. So I'm going to ask for her to come on and for her to talk about really the core of how we help people get back on their feet uh, with some of those employment programs. And that, that is her specialty. All right. Thanks, Carly. That would have been a cue for Carly to come on. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carly Haug. I'm one of the employment program coordinators for the Community Corrections Employment Program, and I'll be sharing my screen here shortly. All right, so once again, uh, I'm excited to provide you all an overview of our program services and how we assist the reentry population with employment needs. Uh, Carly, we're not seeing the, the can you reshare the screen? Oh, absolutely. Sorry about that, folks, just a moment. While well, she's doing that, um, Carly's program is something that we partner with a lot in the community. Um, and after Carly um, is sharing the information about CSEP, we're also gonna talk about co-enrollment in other programs as well, so. Carly, it looks like you're up and running. I'll let you All go. right, sorry about that, folks. All right, uh, so CSEP is a statewide program and it's part of the Division of Community Corrections. As you can see, there are eight regions and as Chris mentioned, there's a coordinator for each region. Uh, it does look like we have cover a large area, but it's often based on population as well as institutional releases. So CSEP, like I mentioned, is a statewide program designed to assist offenders in obtaining the skills necessary to obtain and maintain employment in a competitive work environment. There are three main components to the CSEP program. Uh, real briefly, there, there's work experience, or WE, which is designed to provide meaningful work experience opportunities to clients with limited or no work history. Additionally, we have on-the-job training, or OJT, which provides employers reimbursement for training wages if they hire a client within the program. And then we also have our training opportunities for placement program, which is for clients who maybe need educational or vocational training to obtain employment. And I'll go over those in a little bit more detail shortly. All right, and then how does someone get enrolled into the CSEP program? Uh, for our referral process, there's one of two ways. The first is through a client's probation parole agent. The agent completes a 2724 referral form and sends it to their coordinator who will determine eligibility and schedule an orientation with the client. And then secondly, there are DAI regions. So in that scenario, either myself or a staff member at a correctional institution 
determines a person in our care is eligible for services upon their release and coordinates a conference call after interest is confirmed. Uh, this makes it possible to have clients pre-screened and more prepared for when they are released to the community. The coordinator maintains contact with the client's agent um, regarding the referral of both pre and post release. Because the pre referral process only includes these two options, as a community member, you can always inform a client of CSEP and encourage them to discuss the matter with their agent to get the referral process started. And the reason we wanted we want this process is so that it's more streamlined and the agent can determine some of the referral criteria that will be covered next, as well as include CSEP in a client's case plan. So as far as some of the referral criteria, a priority is given to clients who have a probable to highly probable employment need per COMPASS. And COMPASS is a assessment tool utilized by a DOC. And then the individual, of course, needs to be on community supervision and have at least six months remaining on their community supervision. The client also needs to be willing to fully participate in the CSEP program since we are a voluntary program. And we wanna make sure they don't have any legal barriers at the time. So that could include you know, some upcoming court cases or pending charges, and then um, no unresolved criminogenic needs that would preclude participation in full-time employment. So that might be some active AODA issues or so forth where we'd want the agent to work on some of those concerns first before we consider employment and then not receiving some similar services or duplicating services. All right, so next I'll get into those three main components. Uh, so firstly, we have the work experience program again, which is designed to provide that meaningful work experience and help that um, client reach their goals and move forward into regular self-sustaining employment. So an individual would be placed at a public or nonprofit agency, and it, it gives them a time to work on some of those skills and transition back into the workforce. Um, we is an actually paid in opportunity, and the current pay rate is $11 an hour. We also have our on-the-job training, and that assists clients by obtaining a permanent employment and we would provide wage subsidies to the employer while the participants are in training. So we'd create a contract agreement between the employer and CSEP. And as long as that participant is in a permanent position, so it wouldn't be able to do it for, let's say, attempt to hire or a contract position, and the wage is set for the prevailing wage. Uh, so the employer is reimbursed 50% of the individual's wages during the first 120 days up to the maximum contract amount. And as you can see from the table below, the maximum contract amounts are based on the hourly uh, wage benefit, which would be, well, up to 3,000. We also have direct placement services. And those are for clients who might be a little bit more ready. Um, this can include a general orientation or referral to local employment resources, such as where their nearest job center is located. Uh, we can also give someone some labor market information in case, let's say they're, they've always lived in the Fox Valley area where there's a lot of manufacturing and suddenly they're moving to the Wisconsin Dells area. We might be able to let them know more about the hospitality industry. Uh, we can also assist with resume development, interviewing. Um, I've done career assessments for folks. I mean, anything re related to employment training, we can try to figure it out. Uh, let's see here. We also do have referrals and funding for state ID and license assistance. And we can assist with job search strategies that might include how to use different keywords on Indeed or the Job Center of Wisconsin website or how to make the most out of a job fair. Um, additionally, I did want to add that direct placement services and referrals will differ from region to region, but the local coordinator will be knowledgeable of services in their area since we are statewide. 
Uh, CSEP is also able to assist with fidelity bonding, which is a business insurance policy that protects the employer in case of any loss of money or property due to employee dishonesty. Uh, there's no paperwork for the employer or new hire, and I believe this will be covered a little bit more in depth by another presenter, uh, but for DOC, we do have a coordinator who assists the CSEP program with that. We're also able to pre-certify employers for the work opportunity tax credit, which is a $2,400 federal tax credit available to employers who hire individuals from eligible target groups, which for our purpose includes ex-felons. If an employer hires a client in CSEP, they could utilize the tax credit as well as OJT and be reimbursed up to 5,400. So that's a really nice incentive for working with the CSEP program. All right, next we have our training opportunities and placement program or TOP which is for approved clients who have a employment link to need for educational or vocational training to obtain employment. So our, our educational vouchers, those would typically be used at let's say a tech college or a UW extension. And a client would have to be FAFSA ineligible in order to secure funding through CSEP for that. And we can help out with about 800 per semester up to four semesters for that. We also have our training vouchers, which are typically used at like a community agency or a private agency where they're offering a training that has a fee associated. So some common scenarios for that would be, oh, let's see, are there CDL or a welding boot camp? And then approval is always dependent on availability of funds. And I believe the training voucher is up to 1600. And then we also do offer support services, and those are on a limited basis to clients, and they need to relate to their employment and training needs. Uh, but we can assist with transportation if an individual needs, you know, some bus passes to get to work. Um, that's usually just to get them through to their first paycheck. And then we can also purchase clothing for interview purposes, um, as well as for jobs. So. They need steel toed boots or if their employer requires a certain uniform uh, we can see if we can assist with that as well uh, there's also gas only cards to get to trainings or work and on a limited basis we might be able to help out with tools um, so i've assisted let's see a welder with a welding helmet an apron um, or a mechanic with some hand tools to get started uh, CSUP also has a statewide agreement with the DMV to assist clients with the costs associated with obtaining identification or driver's licenses. All right, and then these are all the coordinators for the area. Um, just wanted to share that slide again in case you want to reach out to your local coordinator and it looks like all the counties should be on there as well. Any questions? Yeah, actually, we do have a question, and I think oh. it relates definitely to you folks as well as to our next presenters as well. Um, the question was, I'm a public safety specialist at the Mead Library in Sheboygan. I have a large number of individuals who are reentering society in our community. A lot of these individuals are not from this community or state for that matter. So how do I better assist them with their quest for better days? So if somebody is coming in and they're moving to our state is that something where they could work with you or should they be working with some of the programs that we have coming up do you think carly well so if they're currently on supervision in the state of wisconsin once again they can talk to their agent about obtaining a csep referral and then if they're determined eligible we can always give them that labor market review for the area get them connected with some of the other resources and panelists on here and go from there Sounds good, thank you. And um, one of the things that's really nice is uh, Carly actually comes to our local job center and she goes throughout the you know, six counties that she's working with and actually, I think your territory is larger than that. So, um, but basically what happens is she comes in and does a job club. So a lot of the individuals are coming here to a, a site where there are lots of other resources available. And it's, I find it to be very helpful because 
if the person is looking for housing, rather than Carly having to do everything, she can send that person down the hall. Um, we have a number of partner programs that also work a lot with you know, folks re-entering the system. Um, we have Amy here from Forward Service Corporation, and she's going to talk about the, what we call the FSET program. And then we also have Rachel, who's coming from the WIOA program, or WIOA sometimes it's known as. So um, if there aren't any further questions for Carly, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Amy. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Carly. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Um, like Julia mentioned, my name is Amy Ernest, and I work for Forward Service Corporation. Um, we are a nonprofit employment and training program that actually um, operates programs in 51 counties in the state of Wisconsin. So we're pretty spread out. Um, I work out of Region 5 or Region 10, depending on how they want to word it. Um, so I actually oversee the FSEP program um, for Jefferson, Dodge, Columbia, Sauk, and Marquette County. And then we also have an uh, office in Dane at the Job Center. And we also have an office at the South Madison office in Madison. So um, our region covers those areas directly. Um, overall, in other regions, as well as in ours, we offer programs such as Wisconsin Works, which is W2, um, FSET, which I'll talk about here in just a minute. We also offer um, transportation assistance. So we do have two interest-free loans that individuals may uh, apply for if eligible for um, car repair or car purchase. We also have um, other services uh, such as emergency assistance to help folks um, so with, within Ford service. So with that, um, I'm just gonna get into FSET just because that's the one I know the most about. Um, so FSET is Food Share Employment and Training and it's exactly that. The only eligibility requirements for our program is to, for an individual to be on food share. Um, and if they are, they just reach out to us and we offer similar employment and training services to what Carly just talked about with their program. Um, we are able to assist them with their job search. So um, maybe that's just making referrals to local openings that we know of, um, <clears throat> helping with the resume, helping with interviewing. Um, we're able to help with some training education. So maybe somebody comes in the door and they're like, I've worked as a welder my whole life. I don't want to do it anymore. I want to try something different. So we can explore other training and education opportunities out there, whether they be through a technical college um, or within our agency. Ford Service Corporation does offer some internal um, trainings as well that individuals can take that are enrolled in our programs to get certifications out of um, to get job ready for specific skills. We also assist people with GEDs. Um, so if they come in and they're ready to uh, jump right back into that, we can help with resources as well as offset some of the costs um, to that. Uh, we help with transportation. So similar to uh, the uh, corrections program, we are able to assist with um, gas cards for individuals, taxi vouchers, bus passes, depending on what the local transportation is in their county. And then other supportive services such as work clothing, interview clothing, work tools, um, things specifically geared towards that training or employment um, resources as well. We are all able to refer to uh, childcare resources. Um, sometimes we're able to help with some, some additional costs to childcare. Um, it's on a need, need basis as well. Um, and then again, like I mentioned, career planning. So maybe if somebody wants to maybe take a career assessment, because again, they're looking to change change your career path. We can sit down with them and, and walk through some assessments with them. Volunteering, we also do offer some uh, work experience uh, volunteering in our areas. Um, at this time, unfortunately, ours aren't paid, but they're a great work experience for somebody who's just looking maybe to try something different, something else to add to their resume. Um, and then of course, like I mentioned, referrals. We get a lot of folks that come into our offices that are looking for additional assistance with maybe housing um, or other transportation, childcare. And so we are uh, we refer folks out. Um, as Julia has mentioned, we have uh, quite a few staff that work at the job center. So if they don't um, know the answer or we don't have the resource available within our organization, we will certainly refer them out to other agencies to assist them with a specific need. Um, again, with the food share employment and training program, the only requirement is to be on food share. So if you have an individual in your area um, that's looking for some employment and training assistance, 
Um, they can reach out to their local consortium. They can call if they're not receiving food share and apply for it. If they are receiving food share, they can call and just say, I'd like a referral to the FSET program. And it is a program that is throughout the whole state. So even if Ford Service Corporation doesn't cover that area, there is another agency that would run the FSET program in that in that specific county. Um, let's see, I think that's kind of the gist of it. Um, all our offices are currently open. Um, so again, um, in our region, Jefferson Dodge, um, Sauk, Columbia, and Marquette counties and Dane counties, we all have staff uh, Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30, so someone can just come in and walk in as well if they are interested in learning more and getting involved in the program. So with that, I'm gonna leave it open for questions. Super. I think what I'm going to do is probably put the way that people can apply for whether it's they're looking for food share or they're looking for uh, W-2 or any of the other assistance programs, child care assistance. There is one portal that people need to go to in order to sign up for those kinds of services. And once a person is deemed eligible for food share, they can certainly volunteer um, to become a part of the what we call the EPSAT program, that food share employment and training program. And so I know that a lot of times, even though there's overlap between Carly's program, Amy's program, and Rachel's program that's coming up, a lot of times what we try to do is coordinate those services so that this person's paying for that, this person's paying for this. And sometimes it's a matter of, boy, they have transportation available right away. We can't do that. So we're going to have them help you with this, and we're going to you know, touch base and, and help you with that. So a lot of coordination of services as well as co-enrollments. So for the individual who, you know, you're wondering like, how can I help them get connected to services? This uh, website that I'm gonna put in the chat is probably gonna be a good way to get that person started. Okay, terrific. Any other questions for Amy? If not, I'm gonna pass it over to Rachel. Thanks so much, Amy. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Stewart. I'm a career planner with the WIOA Adult and Dislocated Worker Program. And so WIOA is Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which comes from the Department of Labor. Um, WIOA covers a lot of territory. And I think part of the confusion um, for people in the community doing referrals is that it's, it's very regionally based. Um, but really the program is the same across the different regions, but you might see different names attached to whoever is running the program in your region. So in our region, which is, um, I cover Dodge and Jefferson County, and then there's Dane, Columbia, Sauk, and Marquette counties, we're called WorkSmart Network, but in different areas of the state, there might be different names attached to it. The important thing to remember is that the services will be the same. Some regions might have a bigger reentry program, which is sort of packaged nicely if they have a larger number of reentry folks. And then some of us out in the smaller, the smaller areas uh, maybe don't have like the package, but we can still offer the same services. And I think that's just important to keep in mind um, if you get confused about who to refer to, what, who does what. We all do a lot of the same services for folks. Um, for the WIOA programs, our main goal is um, employment, getting people back into the workforce. Sometimes that involves training, short-term training in an in-demand field. And sometimes it involves those career services like resume, interview, um, the, the local market information, just making sure people know what jobs are available, what um, wages they might expect to make in a certain uh, field um, and doing that career planning with people. Another part of our program that I really like is some of the longer range planning that we do with individuals. Sometimes people need to get a job right away. They need to pay for bills. They have expectations from other programs they're attached to, um, and they just need to have an income right now. But they might also need to do some longer term planning if they're taking a temporary job, um, if they're taking a job that sort of has an, a, a wage cap that might not be sustainable for the long term. 
we can help them lay out a plan for, okay, when my temporary job ends in three months, what is the longer term plan so that we can continue working with those folks and they don't end up falling off from employment. Um, our big goal when we're working with our partner agencies is to try not to duplicate services. So, you know, don't feel like if you're referring to different programs that the person you are working with in the community is going to be overwhelmed and have all these different things to do. We're all really mindful that we shouldn't be um, repeating services that other programs are providing, but we are able to better layer our services if they're working with multiple agencies. Um, Amy and I just had a customer who was attending a training and so, you know, our program was able to pay for that training and their program was able to do some mileage reimbursement. So that, that customer received more services um, in a more timely manner than maybe if they were just working with one program. So for the WIOA programs, the best way to know what's available in your area is to reach out to the job centers or the workforce development boards. Um, I will share the screen here. So this, what you're seeing now is available on the Job Center of Wisconsin website. And this is an interactive map where you can find your local job center. So like I'm based in Jefferson, not every single county has um, a job center, but this way you can help to find the closest one for whoever you're working with. And then there's also, sorry, I'm gonna stop sharing and then reshare because I can't see my tabs. <laughs> the Wisconsin Workforce Development Boards, and I'll send these links out to Lori too. Um, this shows you what Workforce Development Board region you might be in. And so both this and the Job Center, is just a great resource for you to know who you could reach out to, to find out the best referral source for you. Um, one of the great things about the WIOA programs is that we, our eligibility is really basic. Um, one of the main criteria is just that people are eligible to work in the United States. And then we can help people look at their situation to see what particular program they might be eligible for once we've established the, just the general criteria. Um, and so I think it's a great place to send folks just to make sure they're getting some services right away um, while they're also getting eligibility determined for other programs. And I know I did not go into just trying to be mindful of time. I didn't go into all of the different things that we offer, um, but we can offer a lot of the same things that were mentioned. So those work experiences on the job trainings, um, some supportive services like mileage, um, et cetera. So I'm sorry it was so general, but we do cover a lot of territory. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Yeah, I mean, again, it sounds like a lot of the same things, but um, in the example that Rachel just gave, you know, she and Amy were sharing a, you know, a customer and sharing those costs. And a lot of times that's what we like to do is make sure, and you put it perfectly, Rachel, it's layering those resources, right? Making sure that we're not duplicating services, but that a person is able to take advantage of all of those different resources that would be available to them. So at this I point, so. I'm not seeing anything in the in the chat or any questions. Just um, one more thing, Julie. I think I know sure. that we do longer presentations for our program for our region, and I'm, I would assume that other regions do as well. So, you know, people can always reach out to to you or myself for our region good. for a bigger sounds presentation if they want one. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. And I do think um, Mark just put in the in the uh, chat 
he just put in the job center of Wisconsin link so that everybody's got that to the directory. So again, if you're in a different part of the state, using that directory is great. It tells you about all of the different resources that are available, whether the person is um, maybe their younger adult. And so they're looking for somebody with the out of school youth program. That might be something that you can also find right on that. If you are working with a veteran, maybe that's um, involved uh, and, and is in need of some services. That map again talks about all of those different services, who you're, where you can find your local DVR offices, that sort of thing. So again, um, it talks about a lot of those different pieces and it also talks about your local job centers. And we have Jen who's here with us today from Job Service, Wisconsin Job Service. And she's gonna to talk to you a little bit about the fidelity bonding, but also in general, what kind of services job centers and job service in particular can provide those individuals. Again, no cost to the individual. So Jen, I'm gonna have you take it away, thanks. All right, thank you. So hello everyone, I'm Jennifer Burkowski. I work for job service. And first I wanna thank Rachel for sharing that map. And just so you know, you click on any county even if that county does not have a physical job center located in it, it will give you the information for the closest job centers to you and their hours of operation. So it's just a great tool to use. And like Julie said, you can access other information as well. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully it will pop up. I don't know if it's just being really slow. Oh, here, share. Okay. Can everyone see that, I hope? So job service has um, physical locations located throughout the state. I work out of the Dane County Job Center primarily, but we cover um, six counties. And in those six counties, Dane, Dodge, Columbia, Marquette, Sauk, Jefferson. We also have a location in Sauk and a location in Jefferson. In addition, um, we in, well, I should say we, D, we being DWD, because that's who Job Service works under DWD, DWD and um, DOC started partnering back in 2018 and opened up the very first job center in a correctional facility, and that was in Oregon at the Oak Hill Correctional Facility. They have rolled out several more and will continue to roll out those services so that we can help um, the PIOCs, persons in our care, um, formerly used to be called inmates, but they now use PIOCs. So we like to, you know, we work with them pre-release, usually about 30 days or so prior to release to help them connect with employment opportunities. So all of the services we offer are offered both out in the community and in, in the job centers that are located within the DOC facilities. Um, our only criteria is you walk in and you want our services. That's it. There are no other eligibility requirements other than you wanting our help. So we do one-on-one -on -one appointments. Our resource rooms have computers that are available, um, just like the, the job centers in the correctional facilities. We help people with resumes. We help them with interviewing. Um, specifically, um, employer suggestions. I do business services, so I work with a lot of employers. I plan events, job fairs, hiring events, on-site recruitments. So I do, when I'm having interactions with employers, I do ask them about, you know, are you a second chance employer? Are you felon friendly? So I have compiled a list of employers that um, have indicated that they are willing to give people that second chance. Um, we like to educate people about the work opportunity tax credit. Typically though, when I'm working with um, job seekers here or DOC facility, um, I've noticed that most employers actually have those questions as part of the application process these days. So uh, most employers are pretty well aware of that resource. Um, there's lots of community resources that we like to refer people to. So again, it's that kind of that referral process. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who say, oh, I'm looking for help with transportation. Oh, you're on food share. So yes, why don't you reach out to your food share person and see if you can get connected to the FSET program? Oh, you're interested in training and education. That would be in our area work smart the we owe a program so we do a lot of cross referrals um you oh you're a veteran 
I will connect you with our vet rep. Oh, you are on SSDI, but you want to work. Let's get you connected with the DVR program. So it's really nice that we've become so familiar with each other's programs that we can do a lot of those um, referrals um, because we know about so many community resources. Oh, you need help with housing. Let's, let's figure out what we can do to get you housing. And I do that a lot when I'm up at Oak Hill. So I go to Oak Hill every Monday. And so every Monday, all day, I'm working with the PIOCs. Um, I have a gentleman who's getting out next Tuesday to Waukesha. So I've been helping him connect with resources in his area for housing. He has housing set up for 30 days, but it's the more long-term housing he needs help with. Um, again, those are the great things that we'd like to help people with, but specifically fidelity bonding. And I know Carly talked about how in their program, they do fidelity bonding. Fidelity bonding is a statewide program. Um, it provides bonding for anyone who's not eligible for commercial bonding. It covers ex-offenders, of course, um, ex-addicts, people who have poor credit or maybe have declared bankruptcy, people who have been dishonorably discharged from the military, persons lacking a work history who are from low-income families, and anyone who's received TANF benefits. So that's temporary assistance for needy families, the W-2 program, or what used to be known as the AFDC program. So for the most part, most people would qualify under the umbrella of being eligible for fidelity bonding. What it is, is like a $5,000 insurance bond, insurance policy um, that covers the employee for any things like theft, larceny, things like that, anything that they might do. Um, so typically if an employer has concerns about hiring somebody based on one of those areas, the fidelity bonding is meant to be kind of like an insurance policy that you know, if something does happen, this person does something they shouldn't do, you'll be covered under this $5,000 insurance bond. It's free for the employer. It's free for job seekers. It's good for six months. Um, but we can also always add towards the end of that six months request an additional six month bond be issued as well. The process is very simple. Um, they do have to have an offer of employment with a start date in order for us to process the paperwork. Um, I usually when I'm um, educating job seekers about this program and also educating the employers, but specifically the job seekers, I talk about, you know, having this fidelity bonding as kind of a tool in your tool bag that when you're in maybe in an interview, if the question comes up like, you know, we have some concerns about your background, we're not quite sure um, if something happens, you know, that's when I would tell them that's a good opportunity to say, you know what, I understand, I hear your concerns. I don't know if you're aware of the Fidelity Bonding Program, uh, but I'm eligible for this program and it would cover, cover you for up to $5,000 for six months, it's free for you. Um, there are bonding coordinators across the state. I am the local bonding coordinator in our area. Um, but again, actually, again, Job Center of Wisconsin has that link and I put the link in my PowerPoint. Um, so again, I cover Dane, Dodge, Columbia, Jefferson, Marquette, and Sauk counties. Um, so it's just a great tool to use, but just know that, you know, um, we have so many resources with job service to help not just reentry people, but all job seekers. That's our goal is to connect employers and job seekers together. Um, so I know I tried to speak super fast because I knew I only had 10 minutes. Um, does anybody have questions for me? Uh, I know I gave you guys a lot of information. At this point in time, I don't see any um, any questions for you specifically at this okay. point. But thank you so much for giving the overview because um, Jen is right. Their services are there for anyone. Anybody can come in and to a local job center and start receiving services immediately. They don't have to worry about signing up for a program or anything like that. They can just come in and, and start working on the computer and, and receive some assistance. Um, so again, you know, I know that the libraries are sometimes open during times when our job centers are not. So that's why it's it's wonderful that you're there. But if somebody's there during the day and it's a little more, um, they have a little more needs, then maybe you can provide at that moment in time. And you have a local job center that you can send individuals to, then I would suggest that you make sure that they know exactly how to find your local job center. And that map is going to be terrific. So um, we do have a question that was up there um, and it was about the best way to determine um, 
the amount of people that are uh, on probation and parole in our community. And it looks like, Chris, you just sent um, the response. Could you just pop on for a second and let us know how that is or what Actually, that is? Actually, I was typing a re I was typing a response and I decided, well, since you're, I heard my name, uh, we'd go live with it. Um, so the local corrections field supervisor should have most of that information. Um, they are generally going to be in the county seat in smaller counties. Uh, here in Madison, we have four or five offices, um, plus our central office. Uh, otherwise, most smaller counties are going to be in the county seat somewhere. Um, look up community corrections. Uh, call the main line number, ask to talk to the corrections field supervisor, and you could probably get most of the information. And you'll be able to be put in contact with the employment program uh, coordinator as well. Um, otherwise, the DOC website, uh, there's a number of different uh, searchable, filterable uh, fields and reports, uh, annual reports, uh, so you can find out uh, crime trends and all sorts of goodness uh, that there's a lot of people that put a lot of effort into those products. So um, it's worth a deep dive in our, the corrections website as well. Yeah, and I would, yeah, I'm glad that you said that because there are many times where I am looking at that website just to find out different information for individuals. So um, yeah, if you haven't explored, uh, please make sure that you do that. And if you want to, um, Chris, if you could put that uh, website in the chat for us, that would be terrific or in Will the Q&A. Thank you. Um, I was lucky enough to be a part of an advisory team um, working with Marsha, our next guest, on a legal tune-up tool. And this is really fantastic. It's a way for individuals to be able to kind of take a look at what's going on with them and see if there are some ways that they can kind of uh, clean some things up, I guess I would say. So Marsha, thanks for coming today. And I'm gonna let you go ahead and talk about your cool new application on that website. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Right, today um, it's a little bit, we're kind of changing our focus a little bit. I'm talking to you instead of about a bunch of different resources, I'm gonna to talk to you about one resource that's accessible on a computer or on a cell phone. And it's called the Legal Tune-Up Tool. And I'm gonna to talk to you about it and I'm gonna specifically talk about what we just launched last week. And that's the ability to address license suspensions and revocations. And one of the things that Carly mentioned a couple times in her presentation are the kinds of legal um, or maybe even non-legal, but other barriers to people to getting better jobs, better housing, um, those kinds of issues that crop up a lot, particularly for people who are uh, returning um, from incarceration. And so what we tried to do with our legal tune-up tool is to exactly address that. And so it, our tool is um, owned by Lift Wisconsin Legal Interventions for Transforming Wisconsin. And our mission is to really provide technology, legal technology that's easy to use to help people in Wisconsin clear civil legal barriers to better economic prosperity and to also work on changing the way systems um, address these issues to make it easier for people to have access to civil legal justice and also to be able to use it in a positive way. The, the organizations that are highlighted at the bottom of the screen are the, the founding partners of Lift Wisconsin, the Legal Action of Wisconsin, which is our free legal service provider in this part of the state, the University of Wisconsin Law School, Employment and Training Associates, and the Center for Patient Partnerships, which is an advocacy organization, a health advocacy organization, also, um, located in the law school. And this is what the landing page looks like. Um, if you go to legaltuneup.org, this is what you'll see. It's free and it's for anybody in Wisconsin with these common legal needs. And what we are gradually doing is building out the ability to help people um, address these legal needs. So uh, today I'm gonna talk more deeply about driver's licenses. Um, Julie had originally asked me to talk to you about removing criminal records, which 
I would love to be able to do and which we built in the ability for the tool to help you all with it. Unfortunately, the Department of Justice um, encountered a very significant security breach with their website, not related to us, some months ago, and unfortunately put in a recapture requirement on their website that effectively has blocked our tool from working to help people remove criminal records. We are trying and continue to try to work with the DOJ to fix that problem, but right now our record clearing tool is not working and we are working on developing the child support tool. So what does the driver's license tool do? Well, I'm gonna tell you how it's accessed, the information you need to get started. People can look at what suspensions they have, understand what they need to do to reinstate their license and then get some other helpful information. So this is what the tool looks like when you enter in basic information. You put in your name, your um, address and your birth date. And the tool actually searches the circuit court records, CCAP, and then the driver's license reinstatement records with their DOT. And when it's working again, it's gonna be able to search the criminal records for records that people can be cleared. It's really quick. This is the, the first screen that you enter in your name and your date of birth. The, unfortunately, the gender has to be put in exactly the way it appears on a driver's license. And DOT only has male and female gender choices right now. So the only gender choice we have on our tool is for male and female. And once you fill it out and the, um, the tool searches, then they will come up with any suspensions and fines that you might have. So this person, our sample person, Julie, has two active suspensions. Um, they're both in Dane County Circuit Court and they're both for unpaid fines. So she can click on find out what she owes and that will give her the, act, the information to call her local court to get the dollar amount she owes. And then she can click on the blue button and figure out how to take care of those fines. We have a couple of other um, informational, they're not really buttons, but they're live links. The first is if you've already paid, and um, what happens is if you pay a fine, the court has to then let the DOT know that you paid the fine, and that might take a couple of weeks, so it might still show up as existing. And also people oftentimes wanna know if they can just wait out a suspension and what that means. So we try to give them that information. And as you'll see in a moment, we give it to them in multiple ways and formats. So once Julie views her suspensions, then she can go to the next screen that explains to her there are many different options for taking care of fines. She can pay the fine, she can wait out the suspension, she can request a payment plan, or she re can request community service. And by linking on all of these in the tool, you can get much more information and guidance and forms about what you need to do in order to complete any of these options, as well as links directly to the DOT website. So once she decides what options she has and whether she want, how she wants to take care of them, she comes back and visits the DOT website to make sure she's eligible for reinstatement. And then she can pay the reinstatement fee. Um, Lyft actually, just like some of the other entities that you heard about earlier, does have some funding to help people pay that $60 reinstatement fee um, we don't unfortunately have the funding to help people um, pay the OWI, but we do have the $60 reinstatement fee. And people just have to go to our website. Again, it's right accessible on the tool and fill out a very short form. We check to make sure they're eligible for reinstatement. And if so, we send a voucher directly to the Department of Transportation and notify the person and all they have to do is go in 
and get their license reinstated. Um, we also have what we call tune-up tips. And these are um, a lot more in-depth information, referrals and forms for people who want to take other steps or find out other information. So for example, I talked about the options for taking care of a fine. We have much more information in our tune-up tips as well as links to forms. Um, people cannot reinstate a license for demerit point suspensions or if they have a safety responsibility or damage judgment suspension or no WI because those are much more complicated and require more steps. But they can get information about how to do it. And again, links to forms, links to websites that might talk about uh, the cost for an interlock device or where they have to go for an OWI assessment. All of that is accessible right through the tool that they can use on their phone or a computer. Um, and so for example, for OWI, we can give people information on where the facility is, where they have to go, what their driver safety plan would look like, the fact that they would need um, SR22 insurance, um, and other things. So we are trying to put all of the information that people need in one place. And in addition to that, once people have their license back, if they need, or even if before they get their license back, they can use the tool to get online employment training and services. So we have a relationship with EATA um, which serves Dane County and six other counties surrounding Dane County, um, Columbia, Dane, Dodge, Jefferson, Marquette, and Sauk, where we can help people create, um, answer a few questions, and they create a profile that allows EATA to then develop a personalized employment assistance program. Um, unfortunately, we do not have this ability in other areas of the state, although we will be moving, if anyone's in Racine County, we will be moving in to Racine later this summer. And our goal is to develop more tools that can be accessed using the legal tune-up, as well as um, expanding across Wisconsin so that this becomes, the tool itself is available everywhere. But the additional resources, including the employment and training, are only available in limited areas right now. Um, and if you have questions or you want an appointment, you can email me or you can email um, our legal core, our, I'm sorry, our outreach coordinator, Alberto Prado. Um, and I'm happy to put these links in the um, chat as well. But I want you to also understand that in addition to being able to offer people these online tools, we are starting, we've started in Dane County, we're moving into Jefferson County. And again, the plan is to try to do this statewide. If people need more help, we have what we call pop-up clinics where people can actually sign up and talk to a, a lawyer, a volunteer lawyer about a driver's license issue or about a criminal records issue. And soon we will have the ability to do that with child support. So what we are trying to do is help people as much as possible through this online tool, but to give them other resources and individualized assistance if they need it. Um, so that, that's kind of what it is in a nutshell. I encourage you to go to our Lift Wisconsin website, it's liftwisconsin.org, or go to the Legal Tune-Up tool, which you can access on our website, and play around with it, see if you have any records that can be removed. Um, and, and we're hoping to do trainings all around the state so that you all, people in probation and parole, people at the libraries, people in social service industries, We'll learn how the tool works, learn how to access the resources, and be able to use it yourselves with the people that you serve.
Yeah, thank you, Marcia. That is such an awesome tool. And I, I, I've been so excited about it <laughs> and the creation and watching it um, come to be has been an amazing piece of um, a work. And I, I applaud you because I know you've been kind of the driving force behind that tool. And so it's, it's really amazing. If you have some time, I would certainly encourage you to go online and check it out because it is really neat. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is the employment and training piece, although it's not directly connected to the tool yet, we just talked about the FSET program, the CSEP program, as well as the WIOA program, and those programs are statewide. So if you need some help with the employment and training side, um, I would just say refer folks to those local uh, entities to take care of that. So at this time, I don't see any questions for you, Marcia, but again, thank you for coming and I, I really appreciate the tool. I think it's wonderful and I'm so excited. Oh, wait, there is one. Um, is there one place that lists all these agencies and what they provide? Yes, we are going to be providing you with a couple of different tools. Um, Mark has put together one uh, group of tools and then I also have um, navigating community resources A to Z and this is statewide. It'll take you to the links to all of these different um, groups so that you can access them easily. Terrific. Well, thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is gonna be Ed and he is with United Ways 211. I looked at him when I was talking to him the first time and I said, I know I know you. And it just so happens he used to be uh, the Secretary of the Department of Corrections for the state of Wisconsin. So that's why you look so familiar to me. So Ed, thanks for being here. And I'm glad that you're out of retirement and working with 211. Um, this is one of those things that not everybody knows, but 211 is a national program. And it's a way to receive referrals from anywhere. And I've done that before um, on vacation. So Ed, I'm going to let you go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, and uh, working with um, returning citizens is actually a passion of mine. One of the things that I took out of corrections was the need that uh, we need to make in our criminal justice system in those returning to the public, and uh, everything we can do to try and re reverse recidivism is uh, going to help our, our, our problems overall. I'm going to uh, share my screen with you right now, and let me bring this up. And I think everybody can see that. So I have uh, about 15 slides or so, so I'll move through them quickly. You can put your questions into the question and answer section. But we're gonna just talk about returning citizens today and what the United Way does uh, to help with that. Uh, hopefully today you'll leave knowing what 211 does. I can tell you before I came to this position, um, I had heard about 211, but was not uh, aware of the, the wide range of services that they offer. So with the United Way, the, the building blocks that United Way looks at are education, income, and health. Those are the things that we really focus on uh, with a lot of our programs and the different programs that we fund and that our donors fund uh, across a wide range of services. But formerly incarcerated individuals face a completely different set of challenges than some of our other uh, clients that utilize two-on-one. Uh, one of the primary uh, reasons for reincarceration and the high recidivism rate is the inability to find and or maintain uh, work, housing, food, transportation, and other basic needs, and not knowing where to turn in times of insecurity. Uh, that can lead people back to the behaviors and sometimes the people that led to their incarceration. And uh, that's what we want to try and avoid. This is how we try and counsel folks uh, to make a change in their lives, a positive change. Uh, preconceived notions about former offenders often leads to them not being able to find employment or housing, uh, which is a building block to address all other uh, basic needs. Uh, one of the jobs that I've had in the past was I ran a housing authority. And one of the, one of the uh, reasons that you could disqualify someone for housing was if they had a felony conviction. Well, as Chris uh, had mentioned earlier, that's a challenge for people sometimes coming out. Unfortunately, the Department of Corrections works very hard to address that, is uh, you've got to get the basic needs uh, nailed down for these folks if they're going to be able to succeed after the release. Uh, and incarceration, and this, this was a, a position that I had taken with the former governor, uh, 
it's not a warehousing problem. It's a social problem. And we have to all engage in it if we're going to affect any lasting change. So what is 211? 211 is an information and referral service. That's what we do. We It's a phone prefix like 911 or 411. You call in. In Wisconsin, there are seven different regions. Uh, in uh, the Dane County, we cover seven counties. Uh, but at any time, the entire state is covered 100%. And the way 211 works is our overflow will often go to um, other centers as we um, as we answer those calls if we're overflowed. Uh, you're connecting with folks uh, and with resources that can help. With are trained professionals that are answering the phone, uh, anonymous access. We don't require anybody to give us their name. We have the most comprehensive database of community resources that there, you can find. We have over 300 languages available and contract with the language line. And we also have services for deaf and folks that are hard of hearing. So accessing 211 service is pretty easy. Uh, you just dial 211, or you can text uh, 211 if you want uh, to the, uh, let me get this out of my way here, to 898-211. You just text your, um, your zip code because that's how all of our services are based is by zip code. 100% um, of our resources are available online. So if we have people that don't wanna to talk to someone and they just wanna look at it, they can go in and access our list of resources. It'll go, it'll walk them through some very intuitive questions and get them some information on the different resources they need. And they can see what we have. And, it's an, and there's a guided advanced search if they want to dive down even deeper. Or you can go right to our website at United Way uh, Dane County uh, to get .org, get help 211. That'll take you directly uh, to that website. So what can 211 help with? Well, you can see the, the circle here, uh, just about everything. So we do disaster information. When a disaster happens in the state, very often the county or the state will uh, make a declaration that all information can be obtained by dialing 211 and then we staff up uh, with people to help in our services go from not just giving information on the disaster, helping people register for uh, compensation, helping uh, damaged areas get um, evaluated. There's a lot that we do. Housing is one of our biggest issues. So we help people with finding housing where we can, also with getting uh, coming up with security deposits and uh, getting them into some kind of secure housing. Housing insecurity is one of the biggest things that we face in our communities right now. And uh, we work directly with the homeless shelters, with the food banks, uh, crisis help centers, mental health. Uh, we work with education and trying to get folks back into school wherever, wherever we can. Transportation, we arrange rides. We have contracts with Lyft and, and others to provide rides for people who don't have cars. And then we also help with uh, immigration, government, and legal questions that we refer, refer people to the uh, different groups that we have that work on those issues. So in Wisconsin, as you can see here, these are the, the different uh, 211 uh, centers around the state. And as I said, in, here in United Way, Dane County, we cover Dane, Columbia, Sauk, Iowa, Lafayette, Green, and Rock County. Uh, but the way the system is designed to work is if there is somebody is their their queue is backed up, it'll automatically roll to any of the other two one ones in the state, and it really doesn't matter because everything is based by the zip code. So if all of a sudden we take a call from Alcanto County, and we ask them what's your zip code, we put it in. Those resources for that area are what we're going to be able to access and and deliver to them. So it's not that you know oh hold on we're in Dane County I've got to try and get you somewhere. Every one of the 201 operators around the state can access the resources in, in any part of the state, which really makes the system work fairly smoothly and, and seamlessly. We also run the uh, 211 is the addiction uh, recovery hotline, the, the helpline. We get a lot of calls on this. So we saw quite a spike on this as we went through the pandemic. Um, and it's a statewide resource for finding substance and use, uh, substance abuse and treatment and recovery services. So we get a lot of people to call in and I monitor calls occasionally and you'll hear people say, I've, I've got a meth problem and I need to get help. And, you know, they've tried to call a doctor's office or a hospital and they're told, you know, you have to get insurance, et cetera. We take those calls in and then we try and, and guide them to the proper place where they can get, uh, 
you know, quite often in-house uh, treatment or in inpatient treatment. Um, one of the things, as I mentioned, that makes us unique is we have shared telephony across all of our systems, as I mentioned. So as you can see here, this is kind of what it looks like uh, on our intake calls. Uh, the transfer of calls goes directly into a queue. So we can see at any given moment, what's the longest call on queue? What's the uh, abandonment rate for people who hang up? Uh, and typically our goal is to answer every call within 20 seconds. Uh, sometimes it'll get longer than that. During COVID, we had to staff up with quite a few people uh, because the governor had declared 211 as the COVID information line. And uh, we had to put on dozens of people just to handle those calls, as you can imagine, in the, the height of the pandemic when people were scared and didn't know where to go or, or how they could get tested or how they could find medical help. We also do warm transfers, which is pretty unique. Quite often, especially if it's a mental health call, if it's uh, some kind of a 911 call or a substance abuse call, we don't want to just have give somebody a phone number and hope that they make a connection. We will hang on to them. We will arrange to get a warm transfer across to them, and we hand them off to another live person, which makes a difference because too often if you say, okay, here's a phone number to call, they just decide it's not worth that. And quite often we will also see people who are on the verge of suicide or, or self-harm and they need that handoff. They could, because if they're given a few extra seconds or they're left alone, that can have uh, tragic outcomes. And we also have disaster skills. All of our staff are trained in handling disaster calls. Whenever the state emergency operations center or the county emergency operations center spin up, Two on one centers also spin up at the same time. So we have we have staffing plans where we bring people in. And depending on the type of a disaster declaration, we're prepared to, to answer questions coming in from folks. We are skilled at doing FEMA um, referrals and collecting information so that we can send those over to emergency management for follow-up. Uh, the um, uh, the shared resources that we share, as I mentioned, as you can see here, this is just a part of a screenshot of what our intake form looks like. And it's actually about four times this long. Uh, this is just a piece of it. But we, we ask questions. We don't ask to identify them, as I mentioned, which is one of the things that people uh, find comforting. But we go, go by the zip code. And then we gather information from them to give them the very best resource allocation that we can. Because we don't just want to say, OK, you need a food pantry, here's a food pantry number. Because a lot of these different folks and places, and we'll use food pantries as an example, they have criteria that must meet. So for instance, in Stoughton, there's a food bank down there, but it's only available to residents within the Stoughton School District. So I don't want to give that number to somebody from DeForest or from Middleton. So we have to drill in a little bit further on location, needs, People may be calling for a food pantry and need in particular baby formula or diapers. Well, you know, our, our resources change daily and our staff are on as, as we get a call from a food pantry who might say, hey, we're out of diapers. OK, we, we log that. That immediately goes into our resource database and then they'll call us back when they are stocked up again. And as you can imagine, with over 3000 resources uh, in our particular database, there's a lot of changes that could happen in a single day. For instance, shelters um, for the homeless. Uh, we get cold weather exceptions. Temperatures are going to plummet down to you know 20 below zero or whatever. Suddenly, our phones burst open with people calling desperate to find a place to get out of the cold that night. Um, and we have got the updated list of where we can send them, which ones are full, which ones have made emergency exceptions, to try and get everybody off the street at night. So this is just a quick summary of our activity just last year. So in 2021, we took in 47,126 total referrals that we gave out. We spent 217,000 plus minutes uh, talking with clients, uh, had over 4,000 web page views. We also take text and email messages. So those are also monitored 24-7. Uh, so we'll all of a sudden get a text from somebody, I, um, I need help, I need transportation home, I'm, you know, it could be anything from I, uh, I've been abandoned by a spouse or my, uh, my car is broken down. I can't 
get a hold of anyone. So we we try and make those links wherever we can. And along the bottom, you can see there what our primary contacts have been: healthcare, housing, food, behavioral health, individual, family, and community support, uh, legal assistance, utilities, transportation. And you know, as I mentioned before, I listen in on calls quite often just to monitor what staff are doing. And and a lot of these calls will bring you to tears. I was on a call. Uh, not that long ago, probably eight weeks ago, 10 weeks ago, when we were in the middle of a really severe cold snap. And an 18 year old girl called in. She was eight months pregnant. She was living on the street. She was trying to find a warm place to sleep. She had slept in, she had found a doorway into a vestibule the night before and slept on the floor. And at eight months pregnant, she still hadn't even seen a doctor. These are the kinds of things that'll bring you to tears, but they're the kinds of things we help with. An 85 year old man who called in and he didn't have any money to bury his wife who had died of COVID. We step in and we and we get them resources. The, the range of things that we hear about are hard to imagine, but we deal a lot with former offenders because former offenders are facing quite often, not one of these challenges, but sometimes multiple challenges, whether it's housing, whether it's food, whether it's finding employment, um, all critical things to make sure that they stay out of prison. And we work very hard with, uh, with those programs. And one of the programs that we do is called Journey Home. Uh, Journey Home has worked with uh, over 7,600 offenders in the last several years. Uh, and we offer them different services, whether it's residential services, service fairs, employment assistance, one-on-one -on -one resource specialists that work with them and trying to make sure that they get out and they have their basic needs met and where possible, advancing their education, getting the education that they need. You know, as the former Secretary of Corrections, I can tell you that the correct Department of Corrections does a phenomenal job in trying to address these issues before uh, a returning citizen comes out. But like everything else, resources can be, be challenged. In the, in the simple things that we may not think about, for instance, having your GED, having your driver's license, it was just mentioned, you know, so that you can get to and from employment. Uh, but then they face other challenges. You, you've heard about ban the box and checking the box if you have a felony. But quite often that stops in a, an application right there. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we can help with if we interact with these folks. So for us, education is critical. We do a lot of community awareness and education, and we try to achieve educational goals with these folks of getting them at least to a GED and hopefully moving them on, uh, whether it's into a technical college so that they can get technical skills or to pursue a bachelor's degree or, or even further. Uh, these are all the keys to success that we want to bring to them. So almost at the end, uh, this is kind of the, the United Way roadmap. So our, our motto is change lives. Uh, that's what we do. We bring everybody together. But one I wanted to raise with this group in particular, uh, and I know that librarians have got a, a really particular set of skills that match what we do uh, with resource database work, work, which is heavily involved in taxonomy, which is similar to the filing systems that librarians use. So if you are interested in becoming a volunteer and working in our database, we're more than happy to train you, whether you're active or you're retired or you know somebody who is, please feel free to uh, give them a referral to us, send them over, and we'd be happy to train them. And with that, I, I went as quickly as I could so I didn't uh, drag it out far. Here's our contact information. I wanna thank you for everything that you do and also special thanks to the DOC folks who work with uh, the offenders daily and, and go for the best possible outcomes. You're an inspirational uh, group of folks. And I know that you folks in the libraries are also doing your absolute best to make a positive change. So thank you, I appreciate it. And my phone number and my email are right there. Um, I've been a, a cop for, well, I was a cop for 35 years, I, I'm retired, uh, but my phone is always on. If there's anything we can do to help you, please call 24 hours a day. And with that, I will stop the sharing and turn it back over to Julie. And I'm ahead of schedule. You are ahead of schedule. And, you know, we do have a question for you, though. And the question is, is the Journey Home Program, is that something that's just specific only to Dane County? Or is that something that is statewide? Journey Home, I mean, United Way of Dane County runs our Journey Home Program. And I would have to check with our coordinator, uh, Angie to see if other two uh, other 
uh, United Way United Ways are doing it, but I think it is a statewide program. Okay, that sounds good. You know, the other thing that's really great about going to the website, if you if you were to just Google 211 Wisconsin and you went out there, you could actually do the advanced search that Ed was talking about and you could type in, um, you know, reentry programs and a list of different local community groups that work with that population would pop up for you. So I always feel like it is such a great resource and we often forget about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't want us to forget about it. I wanna make sure that everybody knows. Um, I always tell people here at the Job Center, if there's one number that I want you to remember forever is 211 because right. those folks are there to help you no matter what's going on. And so, exactly. yeah, terrific. That's why we're here. Yeah, thank you, Ed, thank that's you. great. Thank you, Julie, you bet. Yeah. Um, our last presenter today, but not least, uh, actually works with me in the Windows to Work program. And that is something that runs while a person is in prison and is transitioning out. And so Ginny, I'm gonna let you go over a little bit of information about your program. Oh, I can't hear you yet, sorry. My apologies, I was muted. Thank you everybody and welcome. Um, I'm the last speaker for this afternoon. Um, I'm a Windows to Work coach for the South Central Workforce, workforce Development Region. Um, and our program um, is statewide. So the Windows to Work uh, program is statewide. There are 11 Workforce Development Board regions um, and each region it has a set of coaches that work within 19 different prisons and jails. Um, the program is a pre and post release program that is offered um, to participating institutions. The program begins in the institution. Um, so I go into my institution. I work at a Fox Lake Correctional Institution. Um, the first eight to, it's an eight to 12 week program. And the first eight weeks entails evidence-based programming called cognitive behavioral interventions, um, which works to change the participants' cognitions and how they respond to adverse situations. Uh, the hope is that they learn uh, to pause and to think and to use skills uh, to improve their decision-making. The goal is, of course, not to come back to prison um, or to get uh, you know, involved in the legal system in uh, the criminal system again. Um, the last four weeks focuses on employment. Um, so the last four weeks in the institution, we work on developing the resumes. We work on developing um, references, cover letters, thank you letters. We do mock interviews uh, to prepare them for interviews once they get out. Um, and then it also covers uh, community resources to whichever county um, the participant is releasing to, and then we have a portion of financial literacy um, where we talk about finances um, with the participants. Um, the participant is then followed post-release, so after the release in the community for one year. Uh, they are assisted with finding jobs, you know, in the community, um, connecting with the local resources, all these other previous speakers that came before me, you know, they're all good resources for our participants once they're in the community. Uh, our program also provides some financial assistance um, for things such as clothing, uh, tools they might need when they go back into the workforce. Um, we can help with rent, we can help with bus passes, gas cards, um, and we can help with payment of fees that may be associated with assessments, particularly when we're talking about uh, participants that need to get their driver's license back if they've been suspended or revoked. Um, we help with that. The referral process for the Windows to Work program, um, participants are drawn from a monthly eligibility list that's sent from the Department of Corrections for each institution. So every participating institution gets their own list and their coaches go through that. Um, and kind of filter out the participants that meet the requirements, which I'll go over in a minute. Um, social workers in the participating institutions can make referrals for um, the participant, the person, the PIOC, the person in our care, um, and they can also self-refer. So um, 
participants can say, hey, I'm interested in participating in Windows to Work, and they can send um, a note to their social worker who can contact the Windows to Work coach to let them know that that participant is interested. Um, the eligibility requirements for the Windows to Work program is that they have to be, the participant has to be currently incarcerated at a participating institution or county jail. Um, employment has to be assigned as a primary need for the participant. This is an assignment that's done or assigned to them um, when they're, they go through classification um, at Dodge Correctional Institution. Um, there's an assessment tool called COMPASS that is used to determine um, what these participants uh, may need once they're released in the community or things that they need while they're in the prisons, uh, different programs that would be beneficial to them. So one of them, um, one of the needs is employment. So uh, a participant has to have employment as a primary need assigned to them. Um, the participant has to be releasing from the institution within 90 days to a year from the completion of the pre-release portion of the program. Once they're released, they still have to have one year remaining on community supervision. Um, they have to be a risk level of reoffending of medium to high, um, and they have to be willing and able to work full time upon release. Um, there's a few other eligibility requirements that, that, that need to be met, but those are the primary ones that we look at. Um, and again, this program is really helpful for uh, for all these participants, all these persons in our care, they'll be releasing to the community. And our program ties into, like I said earlier, all these other previous speakers, um, because we make those referrals um, to those, to those uh, resources as well. Terrific. Thank you. That's yeah, thank you, Jenny. You know, it's very interesting. So Jenny also goes like Jen B, we also go to, um, the OCI and work out of the local job center that's within the institution. Some of the institutions across the state, like Jen was saying, have those locations now. That's when usually a Windows to Work coach will bring people down to that location and help them start working on the computers and to help them know with their job search and that sort of thing. Um, when someone comes to you and is you're working with them in the library and maybe they're revealing some of their information that you know, they're just, they've just released and in, back into the community. Some of the things that you can kind of think about is they may already have a probation or a parole agent that they can get connected to. They may have a Windows to Work coach, just like Ginny, that they can get connected to. If they're not connected to the Food Share Employment and Training Program, those are things. What we try to do is help people to understand that these are safety nets. And so if somebody's on vacation, if Ginny's on vacation, but that person is coming to the job center, they know that Julie is here to kind of help them and get them through whatever their needs are at that moment. That's when we refer back over to 211, uh, the legal tune-up tool and all of the different things such as bonding. So again, I really appreciate all the work that all of you do. Um, it can't be easy, I know it. Um, we come out to the libraries and, and do a lot of our recruitment at those local uh, facilities as well. We appreciate that. Sometimes we have, uh, we request a room so that we can meet with someone. So again, we appreciate all that you do. Um, I also wanna say thank you to all of our panelists today. I think um, everybody did a great job and I hope that this was really helpful to all of you as far as helping you to know what kind of tools and resources are available to those that are re returning to our communities. So does anybody have any final questions before we wrap it up? If not, we'll go ahead and send out all of the different information, um, the resource lists that we were talking about. If you have any questions or concerns, um, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to one of your local system library educators and they'll get us connected again. Um, and again, I really appreciate your time today and thank you for being here. Take care.